According to the Center for Disease Control, more than one third of American adults are obese. And the estimated annual medical costs of obesity in the US, 147 billion. Conventional wisdom points to any number of culprits. We're lazy, over-dependent on cars, over-medicated, fast food junkies. Tonight, you're going to see a counter argument that we are lied to a lot. That when we consume items from some of our most trusted food companies, which trumpet reduced fat, healthy status, they're actually making us more fat that even when we eat foods that are regarded as healthy, yogurt, juice, the like, we're actually delivering a jolt of stimulants to our bodies that they really don't want. The film we're about to watch, Fed Up, illustrates how broken our system has become and ways we can be more aware of the consequences of processed foods on our health. We are thrilled to have a preeminent nutritionist, dietitian with us, Kathy McManus, who is an author, the director of the Department of Nutrition at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and a member of the museum's food task force. She will give a short introduction to the film, and after the film, we'll take questions from the audience. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Kathy McManus. Well, good evening. It is truly a pleasure to be with you tonight for what I hope is a lively and educational discussion of the movie Fed Up. When the museum invited me to step in for Dr. Mark Hyman, I hesitated, recognizing that I'm not an expert in pediatrics nor metabolism, and I certainly do not have all the answers to the epidemic of obesity in our country. What I do have is the privilege of working with patients every day who struggle with weight. Honestly though, they are not just struggling, they are truly suffering from many aspects of this disease. The medical burdens, the financial stress, and maybe the greatest suffering of all is the social and psychological impact it has on the individual. So I, along with you, want to understand this disease and learn effective ways to support our families, friends, the children in our communities, and maybe ourselves. As mentioned in the introduction, I practice at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. I have counseled thousands of patients over the years to help them reduce the risk of chronic disease and attain a healthy body weight. My experience also involves leading patient groups in our obesity clinic with a particular focus on changing behavior for long-term weight management. Although patients appreciate my support and expertise, one recently felt that she wanted to cover all the bases and added prayer. <laughs> Dear God, my resolution for 2015 is a big fat bank account and a slim body. My resolution, but please don't get the two mixed up like you did last year. So let's begin by defining the problem. Overweight refers to a weight above the normal range. This is determined by calculating the body mass index defined as weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. Overweight is defined as a BMI of 25 to 29.9, obesity as a BMI of greater than 30, and severe obesity is defined as a BMI greater than 40. The Center for Disease Control has been tracking obesity for more than 25 years. However, the CDC recently changed the methodology to estimate the prevalence of obesity in adults, and therefore we have only a few years using this new method. The next few slides show the increase in obesity in just three years. This slide from 2011 illustrates the states in orange with 30 to 35 percent of the adults having a BMI greater than 30. In 2012, another state was added to this group. And in 2013, it was necessary to create a new color, dark red, to indicate that Mississippi and West Virginia now have greater than 35% of their population identified as obese. What are the implications of obesity? 
It is well documented in the literature that both mortality and morbidity increases in obese adults. A meta-analysis of eight uh, studies, uh, 98 studies, or close to three million individuals showed that compared with normal weight adults, obesity increased the risk of dying by 18%. Estimates for the annual number of excess deaths due to obesity are 111,000 to 365,000. Obesity is also strongly correlated with having other diseases. Recent studies show that obesity is attributed to more than 80% of type 2 diabetes. Weight gain after the age of 18 in both men and women also significantly increases the risk of diabetes. In the nurses' health study, women who gained 5 to 7.9 kilos increased their risk of developing diabetes almost two times compared to women with a stable weight. Women who gained more than 8 kilos increased their risk 2.7 times. Similar patterns were also seen in men in the professional follow-up health study. On this slide, you'll see in the yellow line, men have a similar but not as steep curve as women. And they also increase their risk of diabetes with an increased BMI. Another risk factor associated with obesity is hypertension. In the Swedish obesity study, 50% of the subjects who were obese had high blood pressure. In the Framingham Heart Study, excess body weight accounted for hypertension in 26% of men and 28% of women. Obesity has been linked to many other comorbidities, including heart disease, gout, osteoarthritis, and many cancers. Tonight's film, Fed Up, focuses on childhood obesity. So let's look at its impact on our children. In children, we measure weight using a growth curve. Overweight is defined as children with a BMI between the 85th and 95th percentile for age and sex. Obesity is defined as children with a BMI greater than the 95th percentile for age and sex. This slide shows the prevalence of obesity in U.S. children and adolescents from 1963 through 2010. On the left in blue are 6 to 11-year-olds. On the right in red are 12 to 18-year-olds. As you can see, most recent data shows 18% of children and adolescents are obese. So what are the implications for our children? A study of more than 6,000 students in the sixth grade showed nearly 20% were overweight and 30% were obese. In the same study, impaired or abnormal glucose tolerance was seen in 15.5% of the overweight children and 20% of the obese children. Impaired glucose tolerance predicts the development of obesity. Another study of obese children and adolescents showed that 4% of obese adolescents had the diagnosis of diabetes. In a study looking at blood pressure, children and adolescents with a BMI greater than the 95th percentile had a three times greater risk of developing hypertension compared to those with a lower BMI. Other comorbidities of childhood obesity include early onset of polycystic ovary syndrome in girls, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, sleep apnea, increased prevalence of fractures, and likely the most devastating comorbidities are the psychosocial, including alienation, poor self-esteem, distorted body image, anxiety, and depression. And unfortunately, the damage does not end at adolescence. Data from a longitudinal studies reported that individuals who were overweight or obese during childhood and remained obese as adults were significantly higher risk for developing type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and carotid artery atherosclerosis compared to those individuals who were never obese. A predictive model estimates that the prevalence of coronary heart disease will increase 5 to 16 percent by 2035, with more than 100,000 excess causes of heart disease due to the increase in childhood obesity. Truly frightening. I plan to end my overview by introducing the potential for prevention of this devastating disease. A study published a few years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine examined three large cohorts the professional follow-up health study, 
the Nurses' Health Study, and the Nurses' Health Study II. It involved a 20-year follow-up of over 120,000 adults who were not obese at baseline. Every four years, lifestyle factors and diet were studied. Within each four-year period, participants had gained an average of 3.5 pounds, or almost one pound per year. All of the cohorts showed similar results regarding the change in weight based on specific foods consumed. Those who ate potato chips, potatoes and french fries, processed and unprocessed meats gained the most weight. Those who consumed more vegetables, nuts, whole grains, fruits, and yogurt were more likely to lose weight. For beverages, sugar-sweetened drinks, alcohol, and fruit juice were related to increased weight. The authors concluded that habitual energy imbalance of 50 to 100 calories per day may be sufficient to cause the gradual weight gain seen in most people. Unintended weight gain occurs easily, but also modest, sustained changes in diet and lifestyle could mitigate or reverse the energy imbalance. Diet quality is likely to influence diet quantity, not simply eat less, but also eat better. As seen by this study and others, focusing on just the fat content from nuts or dairy is not necessarily helpful for bringing long-term weight management into control. Carbohydrate quality and extent of food processing may be key metrics. Small diet and lifestyle changes can make a big difference over time. So what is the full potential of diet and lifestyle to improve health? Data from the Nurses' Health Study in Women and the Professional Health Study in Men examined primary prevention of heart disease and diabetes looking at five attributes associated with low risk. These include a healthy diet, not currently smoking, moderate alcohol, defined as for women, up to one drink per day, for men, up to two drinks per day, and you can't save them up for the weekend, has to be spread out. Regular exercise defined as 30 minutes walking per day and a BMI of less than 25. Unfortunately, for many of the subjects, only 3% of the nurses and 4% of the health professional follow-up men met all of the five low, mild attributes. However, there can be a major prevention, potential for prevention. For heart disease, 82% of coronary events may be preventable. For diabetes, 92% of cases may be preventable. There's no pill, there's no surgery that can get those kinds of results. There's a tremendous amount of impact we can have from lifestyle. And uh, I hope tonight when we look at Fed Up, we'll have an opportunity to get into some more discussion about what are some effective ways to treat. Thank you. Alrighty, folks. Are there any questions for Kathy after watching Fed Up? <laughs> Who doesn't oh, have a few unique. questions? I am I'm sorry. Yeah. First question right here. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Karen. I'm, okay. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for doing this. Um, I, my question is related to the way people's bodies, I guess, interpret, or for lack of a better word, um, digest, and why certain bodies react by having obesity, and then mm -hmm. others are able. I mean, is there, a, there may not be a simple, but I just kept asking that question to myself. Mm -hmm. Why are certain kids manifesting it this way and others not? Well, I think the point was made that even though on the outside um, uh, a child may appear thin, if he continues or she continues to consume many of these highly processed, um, high sugar foods on the inside, it's still showing up. And eventually, you know, over time, the chronic diseases will come um, and you'll see it manifested 10, 20, 30 years down the line. Uh, I think we all um, digest, if you will, sugar, refined carbohydrates in the same way. And that's really one of the biggest culprits that these 
um, types of foods go right into the bloodstream. Um, the blood sugar shoots up. The pancreas produces insulin to bring the blood sugar down. And in fact, what happens is the blood sugar goes below baseline. And then people, kids, adults get hungry again. So when you're constantly eating these kinds of foods, you're on a, a roller coaster ride all throughout the day. So the blood sugar shoots up, you get hungry because of the insulin, and you want to eat more. So I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a digestion problem that everybody deals with. And that's why we need to think about um, not just the quantity of foods, but the quality of foods, what we're consuming. A uh, quick question for you. Yeah, you want me to take this? Um, what are your thoughts on BMI? Because it seems like it, it doesn't make sense. I worked at a gym, and the guy who owned the gym was six feet tall, 215 pounds of pure muscle. Yeah. And by BMI, he's obese or overweight right. at the very least. So the basis of the entire calculation is wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, so wondering if you can speak to maybe sure. what might work yeah. better. Yeah, it's just one one tool, and it was selected because it's used actually worldwide. But you're absolutely right. I mean, it doesn't take into consideration anything about body composition, and body composition certainly is is an important component of overall health. You can have very thin people um, who have a low BMI who can be fat on the inside and not the healthiest. So it certainly is not um, the, 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 the best measure. It's, it's one small tool. That's all. Yeah, um, how do you tell if you're fat on the inside without <laughs> going to the doctor and laying on the table? Well, some of us can just go a little like this. Um, you know, and again, I think the important point is where is the fat located? Because that is a, an incredibly important part for overall health. If it is around the abdomen, the so-called spare tire, it puts us at much higher risk for diabetes, for hyperlipidemia, for um, all sorts of metabolic disorders. If the weight is more, particularly um, you see it in women, it, it may be more in, in the upper thighs um, and buttocks, it's less, uh, less unhealthy than, um, than the weight you carry around, carry around here. They, they did a study um, a while back looking at um, Japanese men who migrated from Japan to Hawaii and then finally to San Francisco. And with just a modest weight gain, still within our normal BMIs, the, um, the incidence of diabetes and heart disease increased considerably compared to their counterparts in Japan because they gained weight. This is where the extra 10 pounds went around, around the abdomen. So, next question here. It's actually, hi, it's actually kind of uh, related to what you were asking about. I heard on the radio a couple of weeks ago um, it was discussion around early onset diabetes, talking to some of the things they were seeing here, like in however long out, you know, one in three Americans will be diabetic, mm -hmm. and how there's so many people who may not on the outside have any signs or be thinking about this, but that they were encouraging people to go and ask for a specific test from their primary care physician mm -hmm. that, that they're not going to offer you, they're not going to possibly prompt you to, to think about because you're, you're, because of your body, BMI, so everything's looking fine in other, in other aspects. But mm -hmm. I don't remember the name of the test. I didn't know if you did, but they were promoting or just talking about that you should go schedule an annual visit and ask for that test if you have yeah. any thoughts or signs, like you sure. said. Well, there's a couple of um, you know, basic tests that should be done at an annual um, visit for, yeah. for any adult. And one is a, is a, is a fasting blood sugar. Um, one of the... Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they can do a, a, you know, a glucose tolerance challenge, I mean, is one thing that they do um, as far as checking. The other um, uh, uh, blood draw that they do that looks at um, not just one incidence of an elevated blood sugar is a hemoglobin A1C, and that looks at the, the, the three-month measure of blood sugar con control. 
Uh, they look at it in diabetics, but certainly in, in healthy people too. And it is uh, an important thing to do because you see the high risk we're all at. Great. I've got a question over here. Um, it mentioned in the film, and I know you said you're not a pediatrics specialist, mm -hmm. so forgive me if this is um, not something you have the answer to, but I'm really curious. They mentioned it about babies. Mm -hmm. It's fairly well publicized about what is in feeds that they sell as opposed mm -hmm. to breastfeeding and mm -hmm. how culturally those things have shifted in the mm -hmm. last couple of decades. However, there are many, many breastfed babies mm -hmm. that are enormously, gorgeously chubby and mm -hmm. heavy. Mm -hmm. And I had one that was like that mm -hmm. and has grown up to be an incredibly lean mm -hmm. young man. Mm -hmm. What? Obviously, they both look chubby. You could mm -hmm. not tell from the outside whether they were breastfed mm -hmm. or not. Right. What's the mechanism by which that happens so differently? Mm -hmm. Well, I think part of the mechanism is being introduced to some of these products very early on. It is like an addiction, as you saw, whereas if a baby is bread, uh, breastfed for a long period of time, that introduction is, is much later on. So I think that that definitely has an effect on um, lifelong weight gain in obesity, and they've seen that in, in a number of the studies. So breastfeeding is, is absolutely one of the best things that a mom can give to her, her, her newborn and, and, and beyond so that they can you know, set a tone of really good, um, healthy, healthy food over time. Next question here. I just want to let everybody know that the food industry has a science of craveability. They're tricking you into eating this crap. Mm -hmm. That's all I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> well said. <Excuse> me. <laughs> all right, I've got another question here. Hi, um, thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I was wondering about the measurement for children, pre the percentiles. Um, <laughs> because that's measured on like what exists now so I was wondering if that's changing over time if mm -hmm. it's I, and I also don't quite understand how you can have more than five percent that are um, in the 95th percentile I guess. So does, does that make sense it, how you can I'm, have more, more than, than it, it, they were saying that you have um, say like 10 15 percent that are overweight and obese and that would be wouldn't that be more than five percent <laughs> Do you understand what I'm asking? Not, not, not exactly, but I can tell you as far as the growth curves go. Mm -hmm. I mean, unfortunately, um, the, the, the children matched up against the growth curves just as in adults we have continually increased the percentage of kids above the 85 to 95, which is overweight, and above 95 percentile for sex and age. But those haven't changed over the years. I mean, that hasn't, uh, you know, as far as the standards go. Oh, okay. um, one of the interesting things that people do comment on is the difference in different countries. Um, BMI the same and, you know, children growing up, whether it's in um, Japan or some of the Asian countries and so on, as far as their growth curves go, would be different um, than, than what we have. I'm not quite sure about your second point. Help me out. Um, so if it's 85 to 95 percentile that is overweight, overweight, correct. Then how can you have more than 15 percent that are in the 85th percentile? Like that doesn't add up, right? I'm, I'm thinking like if you ha if you line up 100 kids from yep. one in the room to the other, uh -huh. the top 15 are always going to be the 85th percentile, mm -hmm. right? Right. And so right. how can you have say 20 that are overweight? 20 percent. Well, it'd be 20 percent, but then if that's your measurement, that that would be the 20th percentile. I'm sorry, it's kind of like a, it's a, it's a subtle, <laughs> it's a nuanced subtle, thing. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, though. Sure. Okay. The average figure, the base average, mm -hmm. is the same if 90% of people are over it, it's no longer Yeah. Yeah. I see, what, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it just, it, the, the, the scope goes up, the, the, the graph goes up. Yeah. Right. With so more. Like, Exactly. The yeah. Overall mm -hmm. is so bad. Yes. They just still, but you're still keeping the old when it was healthy. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. This will be so. our last question right here. Oh yes. <laughs> 
Um, I have a background in family therapy. Yes. And so I was very interested at the end of the film yeah. when they showed this whole family was detoxing, they said, yes. getting off of sugar mm -hmm. and changing the way they were cooking and eating as a family. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, um, do you have any programs, for instance, at your hospital, or do you know if there are any actual established programs that do treat whole families? Yeah, I, I think, you know, most of the, the programs at children's hospitals do. I know the AL program, which is at our children's hospital in Boston, um, focuses not just on the children, but, but working with the whole family in order to um, help them and um, have everyone participate because you don't want, you know, just the child that's um, significantly overweight to feel even more isolated in their own family when, you know, they're some, the, the rest of the family is eating something different than the one who really needs to focus on, on their weight. So I know in, in the AL program, it's Optimum Weight for Life. Um, they, they work uh, directly with you know, therapists and a whole team approach to help support the family. That's the only way to do it. Kathy, thank you so much for joining us tonight and providing some, some real specifics for all of us. Um, I mean, 80% of schools have a deal with Pepsi and Coke. Wow. Um, but we have hope because if sodas are the cigarettes of the 21st century, I mean, look how far we have come. That's pretty good. Uh, like, we, we, we can do this. Um, I mean, junk food is still junk, even if it's less junky. So we just need to inform and inspire people with magic and fun, as they said in the film. <laughs> anyway, thank you all very much for coming out, and we hope you'll join us again. The museum is very serious about food, our food initiative, and educating the public. Um, so stay tuned and, and join us again. Thank you.